public. It's not that they have geniuses within Hollywood per se. It's that uh, uh, they have special insight through a crystal ball into the future. It's because their job is to program us as we go into the future, always. Hollywood has been an essential part of government, especially in the United States. There are, there are books out on Hollywood's involvement with making war movies. They churned out I don't know how many war movies in World War II. And they had the full cooperation of the American military. And the use of oh, squadrons of tanks and ships and everything to make it very, very realistic to get the recruitment going. Uh, to fight the Nazis and then the Japanese. Tremendous part of propaganda, and it's never stopped. And even today, the Pentagon admits they have funded some of the bigger movies to do with war and Jarhead and all this kind of nonsense to get the young guys in for recruits. Now, just jumping back a little bit into the 1500s, a period of tremendous change in Europe when the, the Rosicrucians were coming out into the open and recruiting heavily amongst uh, uh, what was then the up-and-coming middle-class youth, especially those involved in sciences. Science is very important to them. And a whole bunch of characters were around the court of Queen Elizabeth I, very important people in an important age. You can find John Dee there, uh, Flood was there as well, and Flood is the man primarily responsible for the creation of the Globe Theatre, which was for Shakespearean plays. And nothing is by accident, and Robert Flood uh, was also an alchemist. He was involved in architecture in the Hermetic tradition, which means that they wanted to unite heaven and earth. Always the same Hermetic tradition, the unification of both spirit and matter, uh, the perfection of the world. In their eyes, of course, they knew and, and always did know that the understanding was for those in the know, for the profane and for the masses, they would simply be slaves. They had no qualms about differentiating themselves uh, as a higher class of people, a specialized type, intellectual type. And Stratford-upon-Avon if you break it down, it means a straight ford upon even the river. And a ford is to cross a river. And if you draw it, you have the shape of a cross. And they always say you meet the devil at the crossroads. Even is nova, new. So it's the new straight cross. That's what it meant. And Shakespeare, or Jacques Pierre, the priest of the father, was the magician who brought basically the English language into being as we know it. It's been upgraded since, but that was a major upgrade in, in that particular period. Before that, it was uh, before that Chaucer uh, had upgraded the last one with, the, with Canterbury Tales and other other writings, and before that it was Old Norse and Saxon German that the people spoke. So a new language was created scientifically. It's fully encoded, of course. And it's a pity as well, because we've, we've lost so much of it. We're, we're losing so many words that eventually we won't be able to convey um, anything to anyone else with any precision. And that's called linguistic minimalism, a technique which has also been used on the public because the children, for a long time, have been, for generations, have been getting their, their vocabulary from the media 
and from their music and the heroes that they follow. God help us if we all end up following the sports teams uh, members uh, because uh, if you want linguistic minimalism uh, when they interview these players after a match you've got it right there. So the 1500s was a tremendously important time. It was also, as I say, the, the introduction of the hermetic thought, the perfection of man, uh, which means more than just a superficial perfection. They're talking about going all the way into the, the real religion, which is to recreate that which was separated from God. And that goes back to the allegory of Adam and Eve. Because in the separation, Adam retained the spirit that was given, whereas Eve was given the ability to to recreate humanity, to, to give humanity offspring. And that's the big secret in masonry. And that's why they don't really, really appreciate women so much. They have no spirit. And Albert Pike said that, that the woman can only reflect uh, the light of her husband. He is the sun, she is the moon. The moon has no light of its own, it reflects light from the sun. This is all they're put down of the female. And their perfection would be when they united the two together. It's an ancient, ancient religion. Going as pre-Judaic. And I've never lost sight of this goal where everything will be in harmony, supposedly, again, according to them. But then they do give you their ending at the beginning. That's the trick of religion, to give you a beginning, which really is their end. Getting back to the 1500s, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, the I sponsored these Rosicrucians, to write plays and she attended most of them herself and Christopher Marlowe was probably the odd man out because he wrote a, a about this hermetic group who were bringing the occult into their stage plays and because of that he exposed too much it's debatable if he was one of them himself and said too much, or if he was actually truly opposing them. But he was like Dagobert long before him. He was stabbed through the eye, which is the Masonic technique for, for one who sees too much. There is so much I could go into, and it's a shame in a sense to do this as a spontaneous blurb off the top of my head, but uh, at the moment, time is of the essence, and so everything is pretty well spontaneous. So what I'll concentrate on tonight are a few movies which have been very telling in their information and their understanding of the system. And also, as always, you have your predictive programming, because in the, the revelation of the method in high esoteric circles, you can also put in there a, a, an, an idea of inevitability as well. It familiarizes us with an idea so that when it actually comes into place, we accept it without question as somehow being normal. I like to talk about the movie called Network, which came out in 76, 1976. A story about a guy working as a TV anchorman who gets a kind of messianic brainstorm one day and starts telling the truth to the public. And one of his statements is, he says, you're the real people to the audience. We're fake. When he, when he realizes that the audience are trying to emulate a fiction, because everything you see on television is a fiction, is directed, is produced, is not spontaneous. Uh, guests, when they're on a question-answer show of any kind, 
uh, have the, the pre-planned questions there. I watched uh, a little 